Okay, you guys are worried you're being videotaped? Yes, you guys are. Are you all set to be videotaped? The target made us. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually required, so yeah. Not that we can say anything if we don't want to. Yeah, you didn't sign it, so it's not mine. Okay. What a nice view, though. Look at, look at like, behind us. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm. This is the issue of the other. It's got nice campuses. Anyway, I'm sorry. Anyway, I was right. Oops. All right. Not all of them. The campuses are created equal. Okay. Hey, uh, speaker's names. Sorry. Oh, I'm scared. Uh, shit. Off. Okay, I know who you are, so. Okay, everyone ready? Uh, come on. Steven, and then. I'm Spencer, second speaker. So, right. One. Oh, uh, Lopez, and then Green. How's your trip at home? Oh, yeah. How's your trip, guys? It was alright. Too long. The van is crashed. Yeah, those are the finest rides, aren't they? Okay, we're ready? Yeah, we're just spectating. Go ahead. Alright, so just as like brief on time roadmap, I'm going to go plan and then advantage one, advantage two. Okay, so first of all, the first observation here is that it, this is a policy round. The use of the word should implies that we are taking action. It should be weighed on net benefits. Net benefits is the best for both sides. It allows for the least judge intervention. Net benefits, of course, is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. All definitions in the resolution are contextual unless asked in the PMC. Going on to quant basically some inherency. So quantitative easing is a policy to in, e really ease demand by purchasing goods. The government generally buys these goods. And the Bank of Japan has currently been pursuing quantitative easing to the tune of $712 billion a year. Okay, so going on to the plan. The plan is basically the resolution. It's to end the quant Japan would end the quantitative easing program through normal ways and means as soon as possible. Any questions? And if you want the text, have text. Okay, so going on to the first advantage. The first advantage is that of market stability. So the first inherency here is that quantitative easing is not currently helping Japan's economy. They're currently, Japan's economy is currently shrinking to the tune of 7.1% a year of their GDP. Now, this is despite quantitative easing, proving that quantitative easing is doing nothing to help Japan in this instance. So the second inherency here is that quantitative easing is destabilizing. Since no one knows when banks are going to get this money or when banks are going to spend this money, ultimately what we see is that it destabilizes the economy because it creates a perception that there's extra money floating around, but it's not constant, and there's no definite plan for like how the money is spent. Going on to the link here, the first link is that the plan passes. So the internal links here are that, first of all, this ends quantitative easing. The first part of this is that by ending quantitative easing, it's going to stabilize the economy because there's no more random cash injections. Basically, banks are now going to have a limited amount of money. They're not going to have as many investments or they're not going to have debt and bonds being bought off them. I think it's only bonds, actually, sorry if that's confusing. But basically, they're not going to have these bonds being bought off, which ultimately means that it's going to stabilize the economy because without this random cash inflow, we see that investors are going to be more likely to invest because they don't see it as, oh, it might be better to invest in a couple of years because the economy will be better off later because of the cash injection. And ultimately, this means that there's more investment. So. Going on to the impact, or yeah, the impact. So first of all is the inflationary spiral. When we have injections of money, we don't really know when to spend. This means that money isn't going to be spent. So if we keep quantitative easing, we have trouble with getting people to spend money because in the next couple of days, say Japan could, or the banks of Japan could decide to spend a ton of money. And this would put a lot of money into the economy. Now this leads to inflation. Just having more money means that money is worth less in general in the economy. Now, currently the money isn't being spent. This sort of creates a brink scenario where if the money is suddenly spent, that's going to cause economic collapse. Because it would cause major inflation that stops people from spending completely. And because this would be so complete and so sudden, that leads to economic collapse. Now, economic collapse is bad, first of all, because of the cycle of poverty. When people go into poverty, it's sort of a cyclic condition. You continue to be in poverty because you can't spend the money to get out of poverty. You don't have the ability to get the education to get out of poverty. This leads to dehumanizing a huge portion of the population because when you're in poverty, you're inherently reduced as a person and generally 
and this is going, or always this is going to be bad, meaning that we link to dehum there first. But the second is that, yeah. Are you the one that using those cause inflation? Can you explain like why the like, status quo, like this program with Q demons having right now is going to lead to like, the magical like, hyperinflation like the BRICS? You know? Okay, so the reason that quantitative easing is not currently causing large scale inflation is because banks are holding on to the money. So far, the money that's been gained by the banks through quantitative easing has not been spent. There have been no instances of the bank using this specific cash inflow. Now, what this means is that the banks are holding on to this money in, hope that, in hopes that the Japanese economy is going to get better. When it starts to get better, they're going to really push this inflow of cash into the economy because they want to make the biggest gains off that money possible. Okay, so the second impact scenario from the inflationary spiral is that it forces Japan to produce or go towards aggressive tactics. Since they're going to be lower on cash, they're going to want to make sure that they still appear strong. Whenever there's economic problems, we see countries trying to appear strong. So they're going to go after the Senkaku Islands. Now, this will start a regional war with China. China's already said that there will be a war here if Japan tries to claim these islands. Basically, what we see is that there's going to be a regional war now. This is going to escalate, first of all, because the US has already sided with Japan essentially on this. When China said that all aircraft flying over the area had to identify themselves, the US flew bombers over the region just to sort of say that it was in support of Japan, as sort of standing in solidarity with Japan, meaning that when this regional war breaks out, we see that there's the US is going to be drawn in. When the US gets drawn in, we see that since Japan doesn't really have any safety nets on their military technology, we likely end up with a nuclear scenario, meaning that we get to nuke war, an extinction probably through ozone holes causing huge amounts of cancer and also just great solar radiation that causes the end of life on Earth. Okay, going on to the second advantage. So this is that of bad assets. The inherency here is that Japan is buying a lot of assets and there are no safeguards on what they're buying. Quantitative easing program doesn't provide for specifically what they're going to buy. Now, the banks want to sell the worst assets that they have because this makes it so that they can invest more and save the safe assets that they know will get a return on their investment. So they sell these bad loans, junk loans, and ultimately this leads to a bunch of problems. So going into the plan. So the plan is to end QE or quantitative easing. This ultimately is going to prevent government collapse because Japan has the largest debt ratio. It's 250% of the GDP and the government assets, if these government assets were to go bad, which Japan's currently buying more and more of these bad assets, if these government assets go bad, it leads to a run on Japanese debt, which collapses the Japanese government essentially. The Japanese government will no longer be able to borrow money from other countries or even sustain itself because it just won't have the money to do it. Now, the impact scenario here is basically that of stolen nuclear material. What we see is that Japan has huge nuclear programs for producing energy. Now, if they go under, if the Japanese government collapses, they no longer can secure all of this nuclear material, meaning that we see that terrorist groups could take this nuclear material and start small wars. Dirty bombs would kill thousands of people, hundreds of thousands in some cities. So we see that that's a huge impact to death. The second impact here is going to be that of bank culture. Ultimately, if the government's buying these assets, banks are going to take more unnecessary risks because they know that the government can just buy these assets off them. This encourages the banks to, again, go into this unnecessary risk taking and leads them to collapse because sooner or later they're not going to be able to sell these assets, meaning that they collapse the economy and all the problems extend from the first attempt. Uh, two off, but the second one is kind of long. It's got to be so far, so that changes how you flow through it. It's not what? Like, it's long and has got uh, three so points. Oh, okay. And then, um, on and over. So some status quo evidence we have coming from the economists back on uh, like this past Halloween basically states that uh, what we see right now is that the inflation rate in Japan is at its lowest point in, uh, like in, within the last decade. It's actually threatening every single uh, every single uh, quarter. To
to actually uh, fall below one percent. And uh, along with that, like is a uh, like a there's a correlation, a direct correlation between that and within the last quarter, seeing the Japanese economy contract by one point seven percent and seeing it operate at uh, like an eight percent, uh, le like less efficiently than it should. So uh, what we see right here is that uh, status quo quantity of eating and easing is happening, and these things are happening, but also uh, other like uh, tools that are like traditionally used, like uh, like monetary policy to actually uh, like prevent contraction and stuff. Are actually uh, being used to a far, like relied on to a far, far greater extent than quantitative e easing. Uh, the article goes on to state that basically um, all these other um, like tools that like central banks have, like Japan Central Bank has, such as like actually just uh, printing money out of thin air, or such as like changing the required like reserve ratio. All these things are being like used to the maximum potential that like lawmakers are willing to make them. Uh, like all the political forces that are necessary to like change those things have already happened. So what we see is that like, quantitative easing is the only like potential way out to actually uh, it, like uh, stop a uh, contraction of the Japanese economy. Economy. And we'll get into the, like why uh, is increasing inflation above uh, two percent rather than like having it fall below one percent would be better for the Japanese economy. So there's three sub points here. The first is that uh, it's going to create like rapid like domestic consumption of goods. What we see historically is that when inflation has happened, uh, especially like not hyperinflation but inflation, which is actually like planned through quantitative easing, when that happens, people are more likely to buy like uh, buy stuff like like uh, like sooner rather than later because they know that in the future the price of goods is going to increase. So uh, that creates like a rapid consumption that you wouldn't see in the world of the affirmative. But furthermore, it creates like rapid employment of people because even if like in the long run, it might become not cost beneficial for a business to hire uh, so, like somebody like in the future, it's gonna be more beneficial when they know that inflation is happening and the price of labor is going to increase because they can uh, like, uh, like the job experience and everything is going to increase that person's productivity. So in the long run, like they're going to be uh, like employed uh, for like a longer amount of time. So what we see is that in the world of the affirmative, that person like their employment would be uh, delayed until like sometime in the future. While in the world of the affirmative, they're employed uh, like immediately and like they keep that long term job. Uh, so uh, some uh, point B here is that private debt gets much much easier to pay back. Or, or, uh, yeah, much easier to pay back. What we see is that uh, even though like uh, debt that the federal government is taking on, uh, you know, like our opponent said, is pretty large. Uh, private debt is like really isn't that far uh, far behind, um, and what we see is that when uh, like a currency becomes uh, like uh, it is like it's not as strong as it was before, that means that uh, like their debt in the future like a loan like people are going to be more likely to take out loans to buy houses. Uh, go to college, buy uh, cars, you know, stimulate the economy, like do that sort of domestic consumption and spending, because they know that in the future it's going to be easier to pay those loans back because those uh, currencies are going to be worth less. Yeah. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. This currency is going to be uh, worth less in the future than it is at the time of borrowing it. So yeah, that's pretty simple. Um, and that uh, this is going to be especially true for uh, like under our sub point C, where we're telling you that direct foreign investment and tourism is going to increase as well, because of course the like the local uh, like currency is going to be worth less. That means people with foreign currencies, such as people from the European Union or people uh, you know using the American dollar or what have you, uh, are going to be more likely to go because uh, the goods that they'll be buying in Japan will be relatively cheaper, will have greater uh, purchasing power. And what we can see is that like, in the status quo, uh, direct foreign investment in Japan has been falling consecutively every single year since 2008 when the, like, the global recession hit. So this is going to be critical to actually get this, uh, like, this is probably going to be the largest economic impact of all, because as uh, the economist states, roughly 72% of all people, like, like of the total uh, uh, workforce in Japan is employed in services. And of course, services or like financial services especially are pretty crucial for foreign investors. And uh, like, of course, the tourist industry, of course, is uh, is pretty important for Japan, like that, that is included under the service industry. So what we see right here is that the most important area where Japan needs growth is going to be helped the most by quantitative easing because it increases inflation. And like we said in the status quo, inflation simply isn't as sustainable level as causing contraction uh, of the Japanese economy. So with that, let's move towards our second off, uh, um, which is basically that uh, quantitative easing program, the one that we see already, is decreasing systemic risks. And rather than uh, like, uh, completely doing away with it, as the affirmative says, it should be uh, it should actually be maintained at the very least and possibly increased. So what we see is that uh, the IMF basically states that since the uh, late 2000s recession, uh, develop the quantitative easing programs of developing countries have worked at decreasing systemic risks uh, because, of course, by buying um, you know like buying so many of these assets, like from these like buying bonds and buying debt from all of these banks, they decrease the probability that these uh, like uh, that these banks are going to go bankrupt. And of course, when the probability of that decreases, that means that consumers are less likely to make runs on banks. When that happens, banks can actually keep more money so that they can actually uh, like give out loans for people who want to go to college buy a home, uh, start a family, get a car, whatever. So that uh, uh, prevents the collapse of so many of those markets, especially the, house, uh, the housing market and the automobile industry, which both I'm sure we're pretty aware are pretty crucial to the Japanese economy. So that's going to be key to stopping economic collapse there. So uh, on to the uh, further case, uh, we agree that the framework is it's all good. 
uh, under their first condition, they talked about uh, like bad market stability. But uh, like we said before, uh, the fact remains that like even though it might not be like completely stable, there's a much worse impact on the side of the affirmative. If you're going with like a con like a contracting economy, basically an economy which isn't stable yet, which has like a good potential like for growth, is better than like a stable economy which is stably like getting worse, progressively worse and worse every single uh, every single quarter as we've seen. Uh, furthermore, let's go towards like their impact scenario. They tell you about. Um, like basically money like isn't isn't like being spent by these banks under the current quantitative easing program. But one thing that's not a reason to completely do away with it, that's just a reason to expand it, like at least keep it the same. But also we're telling you that when direct foreign investment increases, they're gonna get more like these banks are gonna lend that money more and more out to actually like people uh, like foreign investors who want to like invest in the end and stuff like that. Uh, from, uh, the impact story about Japan becoming aggressive attacking the Senkaku Islands, there's zero probability here because Japan knows America's not going to back it up with like a full blown war against China because that would lead to the, like, the collapse of the global economy if the US and China were trading with each other and they were fighting. That includes Japan's economy. So Japan, like, there's no reason why Japan, like, suffering a small economic setback, is actually going to attack the Senkaku Islands. We say that's more likely in the world of the affirmative because in the world of the affirmative, Japan's economy keeps on contracting. On their second intention about bad assets, uh, remember, like, uh, even if, like, push comes to shove and Japan has to, uh, to default on its debt and it can't, like, get high loans in the future, it won't mean them because direct foreign investment is going to increase the amount of tax revenue it can get, as well as when, like, more rapid consumption happens. That means that revenue increases in terms of sales sales taxes and stuff like that. And also, even if the government class would say the probability of nukes being sold is pretty low because, like, nuclear terrorists, like, are not wanted in the region, unlike many other regions of the world. And also, uh, like, the, the Japanese military isn't just going to be completely, like, say, let's give up and stop defending these nukes. Uh, so all these reasons are good to vote later. So I'm going to go, uh, it didn't really tag this, but I'm just going to call it disadvantage one, disadvantage two. And then advantage two, start with the assets, and then advantage. Have one ready? All their first disadvantage, they tell you that inflation is necessary and that quantitative easing is key to inflation. First response is that Japan is already doing a massive amount of quantitative easing in the status quo, which probably indicates that if we're not seeing enough inflation, quantitative easing is not effective at causing inflation. Now, according to the economist, $720 billion every year, sorry, every month in quantitative easing is occurring. There's a massive expansion in the balance sheet of Japan's bank. There's a huge amount of quantitative easing going on in the status quo. Um, additionally, they misunderstand our argument. We are not saying that quantitative easing causing, that causes inflation over the short term. Our argument is that it causes no inflation at first, and that over time, banks hold on to this cash, and then once the economy improves, all of that cash gets spent at once. So instead of having some small amount of reasonable inflation to stimulate growth, which is what they want you to believe, what actually happens is that none of the cash is spent, and then much later on, there's a tipping point at which the banks decide the economy is growing, and then they invest all of their cash. And that inflationary spiral is terrible, even if uh, smaller amounts of inflation are good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you explain why like, commercial banks in Japan, Japan would be unwilling to spend this money? They're not willing to spend the money because the economy is declining at 7.1% every year, and they don't think that's going to change. If, for some reason, Japan's economy does recover, that's when you get an inflationary spiral, because all the banks will decide that now it's worth investing. Right now, they don't want to invest. They're just pouring cash into the banks. Eventually, if the banks decide it is worth investing, they'll probably invest all at once, probably cause an inflationary spiral. Uh, they have a lot of stuff about how inflation is good. All of that is relevant because all of it refers to sort of short term, uh, sort of longer term, moderate inflation. It doesn't deal with our impacts today. However, let's take a look at it. They say that it increases cons uh, that it increases unemployment, uh, that it increases employment. Not true. Businesses know that the inflation will go down, which means they're not going to hire now because they know that later on the inflation will change. They say it helps people pay their debt. The, our main response here is going to be term. Most of the debt that Japanese people hold is denominated in foreign currencies. So if Japan's currency gets weaker compared to the U.S. dollar, all of the debt people own that's denominated in U.S. dollars is actually going to be more expensive for them, not less. Uh, finally, they have this impact about tourism. Uh, our main response here is going to be turn that Japan is actually a net importer of goods. So if Japan were a country like China that exported a lot, then that would be a case where China benefits from a weaker currency. But because Japan, since the 1970s, has exported less and less and imported more and more, Japan is now at the point where it is a net importer of goods. This means that when Japanese people are forced to pay more, when their currency gets weaker, they can buy less of other people's goods, which means that they're actually hurting the economy. However, there's no impact to any of this because they're not even winning that quantitative easing is an effective tool to increase inflation. When you give a bank money and the economy is weak, the bank will not spend that money because the bank thinks the economy is weak and the bank thinks that spending that money is unwise. 
And that's why it hasn't worked so far. You should gut check the argument. If they're currently doing quantitative easing, and yet we still have 7.1% year over year decline in the economy, it probably means quantitative easing doesn't work to increase inflation. Yes. Right, so we read you evidence saying that basically like status quo, all the other tools that Japan Central Bank is using are being like utilized for the maximum. So isn't, isn't this like try or die for the negative? No, because our evidence says that quantitative easing is also being used for the maximum. See the economist, $720 million every year. There's a reason the resolution says end quantitative easing. Japan is currently doing quantitative easing. It's not working. All right, the second disadvantage about how quantitative easing decreases risk, I want you to cross apply from our second advantage the specific fact that when we buy assets off of banks, we massively increase risk because suddenly it's a risk free strategy. If I know that you're going to buy my assets off of me, then I don't, I'm not concerned anymore about whether those assets are good investments or whether those assets are likely to be stable over the long term because I know that if my debt goes bad, I can sell it to the government. Quantitative easing means that banks are no longer responsible for the mistakes, which inevitably leads to an increase in risk. Furthermore, banks are not currently going bankrupt. There's no reason to believe that um, like bank bankruptcy is... Their, their impact is empirically denied at this point because there's no reason to believe that banks are collapsed, that banks would collapse absent quantitative easing. Furthermore, let's just note that deposit insurance checks, Japan, like most modern economies, has a system that is designed to ensure that if there's a run on a bank, for instance, there's a government entity that is willing to pay the costs of those deposits, even if the bank doesn't have the cash on hand, which means that runs on banks are not enough to collapse the banking sector. Let's go to case. Our opponents are fundamentally undercovering our second advantage. Our second advantage is about risk, and our second advantage is about the fact that the Japanese government is becoming overloaded with bad debt from banks, and that once that debt goes bad, people are in a position, the Japanese government would likely go under and there would be a run on investor confidence. Their response was the Japanese government somehow won't need loans in a world where we keep quantitative easing. No warrant for why this is true. Foreign direct investment doesn't help the Japanese government, it helps the Japanese people. The Japanese government has one way of getting cash, and that is through loans. If the Japanese government cannot borrow money, it cannot function because states almost always operate at a deficit. Extend all of our impacting about how the collapse of the Japanese government leads to the stolen, the, the theft of nuclear material. They say that nuclear material won't be stolen because there are terrorists in the region or something like that. Somehow I think that if the Japanese government collapsed, the terrorists would come to the region. Like it's not like they can't get on a plane or whatever, like seriously. The impact here is that you have nuclear material currently unsecured. Japan is the largest single user of nuclear power in the world. And that nuclear material could easily be stolen by any terrorist groups that decides to once the collapse of the Japanese government occurs. That nuclear material, whether the impact of that nuclear material is dirty bombs that kill thousands of people and possibly provoke retaliation. None of this is responded to. Advantage 2 is a huge impact, but they're not doing very much work. On advantage 1. I want you to extend our uniqueness that says the economy is already shrinking by 7.1% in the status quo, despite the fact that the Japanese central bank is pursuing aggressive quantitative easing. This is going to be an empirically denied, yes? Uh, why is it not possible for like, quantitative easing to actually, like the quantitative easing program to grow larger? Like why is that? Well, what reason, like there's no reason to think that's a good idea. If we are pursuing large scale quantitative easing in the status quo, and despite that we have massive shrinking, then you have a huge, like, the, your impacts are empirically denied because there's no reason to believe that doing more of what's not working is going to suddenly make it work. They say that if the economy is stable, that's bad. If the economy is also declining, this is the status quo. The economy is declining in the status quo. means we are the only side with any risk of fixing the economic crisis. Uh, they said there's no probability for a Senkaku scenario. However, what I want you to look to is that Japan thinks the United States would support it. Even if U.S. support is not guaranteed or wouldn't come, which is their assertion, then Japan still has that perception. First of all, they haven't responded to the fact that the U.S. literally sent bombers into this area as a show of force. Probably means they will support us. And second of all, I just want you to note that Japan, and especially its nationalist prime minister, Shinzo Abe, thinks the U.S. is behind it. Even if they aren't, he thinks they are, which means he would be willing to provoke the war. They're underworking the affirmative case. The contentions don't make sense. You vote out.
how inflation is basically good for the economy. They talk about how essentially quantitative easing isn't effective and how the Japanese um, central bank has like you know 720 billion on the status quo under the QE program. And they say that since it's um, not effective underneath the status quo, then you know we should end it to that. Our refutation is the idea that this idea of you know 720 billion dollars, it doesn't show that why is that like the maximum amount of you know, money that can be injected to, like, you know, stimulate inflation. You know, it could go further than that. Well, you know, as we read evidence, the other policy tools just simply, you know, cannot, like, just, like, acquire, like, more money. Yes. Yeah, but why should we expand quantitative easing when it's not working? Because of the idea that if you have a system without quantitative easing, that leads to um, essentially a scenario where, like, the pre-2008 um, economic um, the pre-2008 economic scenario leading to the 2008 market crash. Um, quantitative easing is like a preventative measure in order to you know, not have a similar situation happen. And so therefore, like, by getting rid of the program, um, you would see like, these like, bubbles you know, grow and then eventually burst, causing like, economic um, recession and you know, economic maladies. Okay, so on to the um, crux of the contention against the uh, subpoint B about how private debt becomes much um, easier to pay off in the long run. They talk about how if the debt is measured in terms of USD, then um, they, we don't claim this advantage. However, like the majority of debt that you know like Japanese citizens have is you know in the Japanese yen, yeah, not you know with regard to USD, they owe it to like the Japanese bank. So we can still claim that advantage because like the people themselves are then more likely to um, you know like go and invest in their own domestic economy because their debt is like worth less. So against um, sub point C about debt from investment and tourism. I mean, uh, the direct foreign investment from tourism. They talk about how since Japan is a net importer of goods, um, this direct foreign investment like really sees no benefits. Um, to that, we have like two main reputations. The idea is that since foreigners would then buy more of like Japan's goods because um, by keeping the currency devalued, um, Japan will essentially be able to like tax those goods. And so while it is a net. Um, importer it's not like it doesn't export anything and the things it will export will then lead to like greater tax revenue and um especially in the in the industries where japan most needs it which is like the service industry um so that's like the majority of their economy okay so i guess the second off case about how we are decreasing systemic risks um they talk about how japan essentially like any developed country has like safeguards to prevent like um the negative effects of just like runs on the bank. Um, to that, our refutation is the idea that it's better to have it sooner um, rather than later. Like having to rely on the last safeguard isn't ideal with the system we have in place with um, quantitative easing. Then we do not the, the people of Japan no longer have to rely on that like final safeguard because of the idea that the bank um, already has like enough money that it's like holding on to. And um, we don't have to go to that limit because once that limit happens, um, then massive financial shocks will occur and um, will thereby devastate the Japanese economy even further. Um, okay, I'll shoot this. Our argument is that there's no bad impact to runs on banks because the deposit insurance prevents that from ever having being a problem. Actually, that's just not the case whatsoever. When there are runs of banks, that's like, you know, telling the world at large that the economy of Japan is showing cracks. And so when there's large runs at banks, that decreases, you know, foreign direct investment, at which, you know, leads to greater economic maladies. So having to rely on that as like a final safeguard would then crush Japan's economy way more than just having like quantitative easing, which um, essentially leads back into like all of your, your impacts. Okay, so against the, um, on the on case, sorry, against the second tension about bad assets, they once again talk about how um, Japan is like, it's like a bad idea for the government to own um, these 
bad assets. However, this is like simply um, not true. If you continue or even expand the policy of quantitative easing, what ends up happening is that, as my partner and I explained earlier, the Japanese government will then have more um, money to collect in taxes, and so they would be able to handle those bad assets um, better than just the banks would happen. It prevents the um, like bank bank crashes and. Which of course obviously contributes to a much negative, much more negative economy than um, just having the government own and like manage these like bad assets. And then, so their impact to this is the idea that if the government accrues too many um, bad assets, it will collapse and then people will steal nuclear material. However, this is just like patently untrue. If you just look at Imperial, several governments have like defaulted on their loans. Look at Greece, it's not like the government like completely collapsed and there's like a state of anarchy where people can just like steal resources or like steal like nuclear material. Um, there is really no link into their impact and their contention itself. Yes. Uh, Greece has never defaulted on its loans. It's come pretty close, but it hasn't actually defaulted. Maybe so, but the fact of the matter is like, um, when there's um, like the f when since they've come so close, you still don't see like an increase of like outside um, people like coming in to like take resources, take um, like resources like nuclear materials. The government is in a bad state, but it's essentially like won't fall even if it um, if it, even if it does default on its loans. There's no like. The quantitative easing policy won't be like the bright line that causes like government collapse. Is essentially what we're saying. Okay, so against the um, first contention, since time's running low, just going straight to their impact of the uh, of like um, increased aggressive tactics. Um, they talk about how America will essentially back up Japan because they've done so in the past. However, this is also in, like not true. America does support Japan um, just like ideologically. But it won't. It knows that going into full force war with China is bad, and also Japan doesn't really have the military capabilities because of the other world to to embark on a campaign of aggressiveness. And for all those reasons, I urge a make of battle. Now, both sides have been, there's not been any debate whatsoever as to like what the economic problems are in like Japan right now, what they were before this quantitative easing program. We know the Japanese economy is shrinking. But what we see right here is that with the world of, uh, like, when you compare the world of the negative to the, uh, to the affirmative, you're seeing that the world of the affirmative, they don't tell you, like, they didn't read you one piece of evidence telling you that, like, without quantitative easing or, like, in the status quo before uh, quantitative easing, that there was any sort of uh, mechanism in place to actually make the, like, make uh, Japan's economy grow after, like, the late 2000 recession. They don't tell you, uh, like, you have any solvency whatsoever for, uh, like, a world without quantitative easing. But we're telling you, that they, like, because they never specifically peg the contraction of Japan's economy to quantitative easing, they don't say it's being caused by that. They just state that quantitative easing is happening in an attempt to stop Japan's, uh, like, uh, con like, contracting economy, which, as we would argue, like, was happening, like, quite a bit before this quantitative easing policy. And I'm pretty sure they'd agree if you got to ask them, too. So what we see right here is that uh, we also read you uniqueness evidence telling you at the same time that all these other tools, and they never contest this, all these other tools that the Japanese Central Bank has to actually like combat this contraction are being used like used to their maximum potential right there. There's no reason why for like there's no uh, way that you can actually stretch them further. While at the same time they don't tell they don't read you any evidence telling you that uh, like seven and uh, seven hundred twenty billion dollars of quantitative easing is like the magical like cap that can be actually spent. We would actually argue that in a world without quantitative easing, even though like in a world with quantitative easing, inflation isn't like uh, like it, there's no like net inflation, it's net deflation. We would actually argue that that net deflation would be even greater in a world where you don't have quantitative easing, and that's exactly what we've been saying throughout the entire debate. And they'll read you ev any evidence telling you why that's not true. So basically, what you see here is that it's try or die for the negative. Either you go with the affirmative, and you're like basically supporting uh, like a world where there was still no solution whatsoever to the contraction of the Japanese economy, or you support the world of the negative, or basically it's not guaranteed. But of course, we would say that it's a, like uh, like it's much greater than the probability of zero, so because you're like you're uh, guaranteeing contr like continued contraction with the world of the affirmative. Now onto the uh, second voting issue. Uh, this is like some more impact count, which is basically that uh, the risk of actually solving for the contraction of the Japanese economy is worth uh, is worth like some of the dis-ads that they brought up. Because um, let's just like jump straight into their impacts. Uh, they have pretty weak impact scenarios on their like greatest uh, like the impacts that they try to claim the greatest like um, 
like magnitude of conflict, there's really like so like such a little probability to there actually being an American and Japanese war against China because of course the American economy would collapse, the Chinese economy would collapse. There's no reason to believe that Japan is uh, Japan has been being pretty pissed off about the Senkaku Islands and everything. But I really don't think it's going to risk destroying the global economy uh, or like actually believes that uh, like America would like wage a full fledged war against China to do so. And uh, in the past, we've seen plenty of countries have bad economies yet not invade other countries to try to look strong. Uh, and so there's really uh, the, 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 the only terminal impact we have coming out of the first contention is this vague sort of like less market stability. Once again, they don't quantify like why that's uh, going to like be bad. And we tell you like a stably shrinking economy is nowhere near as good as an unstably and growing economy with increased uh, domestic spending or domestic consumption and increased foreign direct investment and tourism. Um, uh, they're saying attention about like bad assets. Like, okay, we can see like even if the Japanese economy does have to default like on its debt, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a complete state of anarchy. Many countries have defaulted on their debt before, um, and like there have like haven't been like stolen nukes and all this other stuff. Uh, if, if that happens, like at worst, the Japanese government will have to engage in like contractionary like financial policy. They're going to have to. Uh, like go through austerity measures and everything, but when you consider the fact that like austerity measures would mean like an economy getting hurt in the, in the like in the short term, that's really not that much different from what's happening with the status quo. So what you see right uh, right now is that basically um, you like you're risking literally nothing, like no new harms happening whatsoever if you vote for the negative. There's only like uh, there's like literally no offense left coming out of the affirmative side. There's only this like the risk that uh, the risk that this uh, inflation is going to be reversed correctly through continued if not larger quantitative easing. Um, so uh, with that, just going on to um, <coughs> our third going issue, which is basically the fact that like the scenario, like the uh, the scenario, like a link scenario they have under their second intention about uh, Japan just accruing more and more debt is simply not going to happen. It's going to be counteracted by the beneficial impacts of like of our uh, or of the negative advocacy because, like we said before, like, like uh, they don't really. Uh, adequately refute like why all this is true. Like, uh, and we told you like in the past, like the IMF actually states, uh, like actually stated before that the growth in consumer confidence and the growth in foreign investment for many developed countries was because of quantitative easing programs and like the logical warrants we give you about how like, you know, debt is going to be like easier to pay back, it's going to be more rapid consumption because these like these investors know that in the future things are going to cost more, and we're also like reversing the uh, the trade deficit because of course when uh, like it becomes easier for foreign countries to buy Japanese goods because of course the Japanese yen is worth less comparatively. That means that there's going to be more capital flow like into the country, especially all these foreign currencies, which are going to like help the Japanese people pay back their debt in the long run. So basically, this just means like the more capital flows into the country, the government has more tax revenue; they can pay back this debt sooner. And even if they, they default, the return on that really isn't that much worse than the status or the status quo before the front end. Yes, Nick. So right now I'm just going to do case overview, and the case overview will be advantage one, advantage two, dissent one, and dissent two, and then I'll do voting issues. Okay. Start time. So okay, the, uh, the negation is overall conceded. Just way too much offense. That quantitative easing will not help the economy. Okay. So first of all, in parliamentary debate, given no advocacy, given no counter plan specifically specified, they they are advocating the status quo. This is important because we have to look at that on the case. Okay. So going over the first advantage. So. They basically concede the argument that currently in the status quo, there's a 7.1% yearly decline, meaning that currently in the status quo, the economy is going to collapse. There are problems in the economy right now, and they do nothing to solve this. This means a try or die for the affirmative. Even if you believe all their impact scenarios, they don't solve anything, meaning that the only chance of solving this crisis is to vote affirmative, because we have a chance of solvency. And even if that chance of solvency is tiny, it is still a chance of solvency compared to the continued decline that we see in the status quo. Going on to our inflationary spiral, basically, they completely concede this. Um, or sorry, they, they argue in one part of this, but they first miss our poverty cycle. Now, we tell you in our first speech that we impact to poverty and we impact to aggressive policies, which leads to war. Now, the poverty cycle goes completely unrefuted, and this is important because we're going to extend that. This poverty cycle should win us the round because it goes completely unrefuted, meaning that they can see that we are going to be beneficial to poverty and that they cause more poverty with these policies, meaning that ultimately that is a net benefit to us. Going on to the Senkaku Islands, basically, they just argue that the US won't go in. That doesn't matter because they're still perceptually leading the Japanese to go into the war. Going on the second advantage about bad assets. 
Now, they respond here basically just with saying it's not true and talking about how Greece is going to stop dirty bombs from happening. First of all, Greece didn't default, my partner mentioned that. Second of all, Greece doesn't have nuclear material. It's not a good test. Extend where we tell you that the nuclear, the high rate of nuclear material in Japan makes it a good target for terrorism. Going on to their disadvantage, so first of all, in their inherency, basically, they just talk about how it isn't the maximum. This doesn't matter because they're not actually increasing it, meaning that staying at the status quo, they can see is bad. That in the status quo, Japan has collapsed. So this means that we're going to be winning this. But even if you weren't to buy that, we go down to their second like link scenario and impact scenario, which we have a turn on saying that when you have more debt in for foreign currencies, when you decrease your, uh, the value of your money in relation to those currencies, you inherently are going to increase your debt. This means that the debt's harder to pay off. They can see this. Their only response here is people invest in the economy. That doesn't matter when your debt is going to skyrocket with the plan. Going on to the second issue here, where we have a term, we have a term that says that export or that imports are going to cost more. Their only response here is that basically, oh, we still get exports though. But the important thing here is even if both increase at the same amount, we see that since exports are greater, there's going to be a greater net detriment, or sorry, sorry, since imports are greater there, there's going to be a greater net detriment there, meaning that they're going to pay more for imports still plus in the economy. All right, going on to the second disadvantage, extend the cross application of our disadvantage or of our advantage. Basically, they make no response to this, meaning that ultimately our disadvantage still exists. Going on to voters. The first voters try or die. Ultimately, what we see is the economy in the status quo is down by 7.1% per year, despite quantitative easing. Since they do nothing, since they stay in the status quo, it is try or die for the affirmative. Nick tries to make the argument that it's try or die for them, but they are advocating the status quo, meaning there's no try or die scenario there. Affirmative is the only team that has a chance of solving, and that is very important. Going on to the second voter issue. The second voter issue is inflationary spiral. So they can see that banks are not currently spending. They never talk about this, never address it in the entire debate. Now, this means the inflationary spiral will crash the economy. So what we see ultimately is that it doesn't matter how the economy is currently going. A little bit of inflation is good, and we agree with them on that, but they don't get this little bit of inflation. The quantitative easing program ultimately is very bad because it leads to the spiral by giving these banks money, but currently the situation for the banks is not a situation where the banks want to spend money. This means that the banks hold on to this money, which ultimately means they are just holding on to capital. Not only does this have problems with the economy, but this means that when they see a little bit of economic growth, they're going to rush to invest in there. Now, go to our impact scenarios where we tell you that if you rush in at that point, you're going to collapse the economy. You're going to cause massive inflation by investing all of this money, by putting more money into the economy, and this is going to mean that they collapse the economy. This is the reason that you can't vote for the status quo is continuing this quantitative easing program not only has no chance, no risk of solvency, but ultimately will lead to the collapse of the economy. For all those reasons, I have a strong vote for the affirmation.